Anybody seen this error before? Yeah, I, I've seen it quite a bit actually. It sucks. Uh, this is Apache's ubiquitous 500 internal server error. It can happen for a myriad of reasons. It could be your HD access is goofed. Uh, it could be a resource issue on your server. Um, I recently talked to someone or a poor lady who this is pretty much all her site could muster up. And, uh, I couldn't figure it out for a second and I found out she was running WordPress multi-user and uh, so I looked at the database and she unfortunately left WordPress <coughs> registrations open to anyone. So everyone created user registrations and they had their own blocks. Well, 10,000 <laughs> database tables later, this is the question. So what about this next one? Right? So what happened here? My SQL went away. Maybe the grants were goofed. Um, you know, maybe um, the uh, user credentials are incorrect. Whatever the reason is, um, it really doesn't matter. The point is that these two slides is that, um, you know, to illustrate really that no matter what you do, your site isn't invincible. Uh, things will break. Why? Because it breaks for everybody. So even the big dogs, it's really how you plan and respond for it that really matters. So, by the way, if you actually want to change this error message in case it happens, you can actually change it to a static file that mimics your site. Uh, it's in the uh, WP inputs directory functions.php. So if you're going to go down, you might as well have some sort of sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did anyone see Rocky IV? Wow, I was not expecting that at all. So this is Ivan Drago. Uh, to me, he is the physical manifestation of my favorite web server, Nginx. So it took me like three hours to put this out of Photoshop. So, I think. <laughs> so um, no, in, in my humble opinion, the web server is the most important part of the WordPress application stack. Uh, Josh talked about this briefly as well. And uh, the most prevalent web server, Apache, you know, powers like 50% of all websites. Right now, it's been around for like 50, uh, 15 years. <laughs> and if you're on a shared hosting plan, chances are that's what you're running as well. So. Um, it's often called like the Swiss Army knife of web servers because it provides so many features. So that being said, it also has the tendency to become overloaded if you're not you know, familiar with the modules process of Apache. So in recent years, a, a resurgence or a surgence in um, asynchronous or invented web servers like Nginx and Lighty uh, have provided some welcome to the explode. So uh, since its inception in 2004, uh, Nginx has been growing like tremendously. I think it powers like 7% of all websites. And uh, uh, as was mentioned in the previous talk, it powers like Hulu and WordPress.com. So obviously, it's doing something right. Um, so it's not too shabby considering its history. The guy that developed this, uh, Igor, it's really a one-man show. So he has people that develop uh, patches for the application, um, but it's really just him. And so uh, he basically built the software out of necessity. He was uh, currently running one of Russia's uh, biggest websites, Brandsburg.ru. Um, in terms of performance, I really haven't seen anything like Nginx, uh, or anything that comes close to it, rather. Uh, it's extremely fast, can be configured rather easily, and it scales tremendously well. So uh, even if you don't expect like hundreds of thousands of simultaneous requests, you can still benefit from the high performance of what the server offers. So uh, that goes from like the smallest VPS to like clusters of servers. So uh, at MediaTemp, we actually use Nginx on a couple things in production, one being our account center, which uh, I believe is just like a proxy to Apache, but that provides like a management interface to like 85,000 domains, so uh, that's uh, quite a feat. Um, I love this quote. Uh, Chris is a co-worker of mine. Uh, he's a performance engineer and also works on really cool things like verb.com. Uh, Apache is like Microsoft Word, has a million options, but you only need six. <laughs> Nginx does those six things, and it does five of them 50 times faster than Apache. So he's, uh, he's really not kidding. Um, although we're going to focus on Nginx as a standalone web server, Nginx can be configured in a few different ways. Uh, number one is uh, being used as a load balancer. Um, I've only played around with this feature very briefly, but if you're familiar with like LBS or HA proxy, um, it's very similar. Um, a lot of Ruby on Rails enthusiasts like it because you can balance like mongrel workers and things like that. Uh, the second way is Nginx can also act as a reverse proxy to uh, Apache, so or any other web server, web server actually. So this is an ideal solution for you guys that have like really complicated mod rewrite rules. So you know how you have your permalink structure in the HD access file. Uh, if you have a lot of rewrites, you have a lot of uh, stuff going on that basically tells your website how to function. You may want to stick with this particular method. The reason is, is that you have to change all of those rewrite rules if you were to use uh, Nginx. Um, so 
the really cool thing about this is this would also let Nginx handle all the static files, so your images, your JavaScript, your CSS. And this is where Nginx really excels in terms of static file handling. Uh, there's a hosting company, Web Faction, that started provisioning some of their shared services for <coughs> this type of setup. And uh, they had some really great results. Basically what they said is both servers, Nginx and Apache, are capable of serving a huge number of requests per second, but Apache's performance start decreasing as you add more concurrent connections, whereas Nginx's performance almost doesn't drop. So the third option is to let Nginx run as a standalone web server, and that's kind of what I'm recommending today. Um, this will obviously handle all the static files we just talked about, but also the dynamic requests like PHP. So uh, you'll also have the added benefit of having one, uh, one less memory uh, consuming system resource and a fewer point of failure. Uh, before we move on to like, the PHP section, I want to point out that if you are interested in checking out Nginx or replacing it for your current web server, uh, there's a superb resource that just came out this past July. Uh, this book even includes like practical examples on how to like rewrite your mod, uh, rewrites for patching. So you know if you're interested, definitely check it out. So now that we've ditched Apache in favor of Nginx, we need Nginx to talk to PHP. This is obviously a crucial part of how WordPress works. So there are a few options for serving PHP. Uh, the most popular options are like uh, uh, mod PHP and running PHP as fast as GI. You know, again, if you're on a shared host, chances are you're probably wanting two of those options. So uh, what I want to talk about is PHP FBM. Um, I like saying PHP FBM is the new sexy. I say that a lot, it's really stupid, but uh, FPM stands for Fast CGI Process Manager. Uh, while this particular implementation isn't used in a whole lot of production systems yet, uh, I think it will be. Um, to me, it represents how PHP should scale with the application and not against the server. So obviously, here are some of the benefits. Process management. Uh, PHP FPM provides the ability to gracefully stop and start uh, work requests. So instead of the web server spawning PHP workers, uh, you actually have PHP FBM running as its own service. And so a lot of people that make the switch to these asynchronous web servers ask, well, what, how does PHP work with this? Like, how do I plug it in? And we'll actually get into that in the next slide. So um, well, one other cool thing is that you actually have a log and hit files all of a you're monitoring your server, like mine, it works very well. So um, PHP FBM also allows you to have a dynamic number of processes. Uh, this is key for like lower resource servers that don't normally serve a lot of traffic. Uh, so you're not keeping like idle threads around, basically consuming memory at all times. So if you need that extra horsepower, FBM will basically spawn additional requests uh, to keep up with the uh, inbound traffic. So uh, just like my SQL, PHP FBM provides the ability to track the slow execution uh, of scripts and record them in a log file along with a backtrace. So if you guys are developing like plugins, themes, and you're noticing something that's particularly slow, let's say on port 9000, PHP FBM. So there's a couple other parameters that actually define like the document type and the document group, but this is fairly simple. I mean, it's just a few lines of code. Uh, I realize this is a horrible slide. Uh, <laughs> so uh, again, I'll, I'll try to explain that. So say you have a client that you just set up using this type of server setup. Essentially, what, what we're doing here is we're tailing the slow log for PHP. And so unfortunately, this is my domain side. I was having some performance issues. Yes, sir. So, are you using the FPM from the Lightspeed uh, implementation of FastCGI? No, it's act we're getting into it, but it's actually included in PHP 4 now, so it's a, it's its own thing. Oh, okay. yeah. So what we're doing here is we can see that okay, my website sucks. So my client calls and it's really slow. What's happening here? We're pulling up the index page. Obviously, that's not good. It's happening on every page. This is the, the main page here. So we can see it's making a few requests, and we get all the way down to plugins. It's a, it's a bad plugin. So we look at delicious for WordPress. So I open up the error log and correlate the timestamp. So at the same time, we see call to undefined function. So bad news. Uh, why is it undefined? Why is it not working? So I looked up that particular function in the WordPress codex. And if you're not using the codex by now, it should be. It's a very good resource. Um, and we found that the fetch RSS function is deprecated. So it's no longer in use. That's why it's not working. That's why it's slow. So I replaced it with its new and better uh, substitute, and voila, you're getting paid again, your client's happy. So that's just a good example of like, how you can use that feature to troubleshoot some uh, performance issues. So until recently, installing PHP with FBM was a real pain. Uh, this is just a, a snippet of what I had to go through to actually get this. And I posted on my blog 
and it ended up getting a lot of you know uh, attention because no one really documented the process yet. So um, you know you're installing from source, obviously you're patching it, you're modifying the configs, you're running the same user. It's a pain in the ass, and I didn't like doing it, and I don't think anybody did. So fortunately, some good news came in this past July. Uh, <laughs> it's now on PHP 4. So that's a uh, 533, so no more messy compiling, looking, patching, all that stuff, just a simple app get. So right now, yeah, you have to still do this app get install at the end. Good question. No, actually, there's a, uh, a one, depending on the operating system, the Ubuntu, uh, there's a, a package archive manager, uh, PPA, and um, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll try to, I'll talk to you later about this, but it, it's basically a single individual person has made a package for this that works. So we can use that. Um, does, does everyone know who this guy is? No? It's, it's not Justin Bieber. <laughs> this is Rasmus. Uh, he authored the first two versions of PHP. He's also a significant contributor to patching with some yeah, projects. Uh, he, he recently gave some talks at, at DIG and another open source conference. And um, you know, he, he profiled just PHP performance in general and actually took WordPress out and uh, made some really good adjustments to PHP core. And also, if you're a plugin or theme developer, uh, he gave some really good tips on using things like Xdebug and Valgrind and things like that. So uh, I definitely recommend checking out those, uh, those slides. And of course, he uses Nginx and PHP FDM at his very own company, WePay.com. So if that isn't like a big ringing endorsement to check out the software, I really don't know what it is. So, um, I, I just want to talk about this briefly. I actually asked Barry Abrahamson. He's a, uh, a, 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 what is it called, a systems wrangler at Automatic, the guys that do WordPress. And he, he said, why don't you talk about hip hop? And I was like, well, OK. So I checked this out a couple weeks ago. And essentially, if you haven't heard, this is Facebook's open source project on a source code transformer for PHP. Uh, transforms PHP code into C++ and then uses G++ to make it into machine code. And I first heard about it, I was like, that's really cool. Uh, after working with it for a few weeks, uh, I feel a little differently. So I just don't see a, really, a whole lot of practical use for this software just yet, uh, especially for the hassle you have to go through to get it to work. Uh, one reason is it doesn't work with PHP 5.3, and it also, uh, you're, you're stuck with a handful of functions. So it's still a really cool technology, and I believe a lot of companies with like large PHP code bases could really benefit from this technology. Uh, if you're like a webmaster pro blogger or whatever, uh, I, I would just suggest waiting until the project matures a little bit more. Um, this should illustrate an important point. If you're, you know, you shouldn't basically, uh, you know, add complexity to your server setup if it's not needed. So if, uh, just because the software sounds cool, just don't, don't mean it's needed. So uh, let's go to the next one here. Uh, Josh talked briefly about uh, Octave caching, and I did want to bring up APC here for a second. Um, I'll be fairly brief in here. Most PHP accelerators work by caching the compiled output of the bytecode and then serving them from shared memory. Uh, that's really the plus, and, and obviously Josh broke down how that works. In my personal experience, there's no good reason not to install an opcode cache when working with WordPress. It's a huge performance increase. We'll actually go into some benchmarks later. Uh, by, by default, installing APC isn't going to do anything. So you're going to need to use like a you know double through total cache, as one that Josh mentioned. There's some other plugins as well. Um, obviously, you know there's other PHP accelerators like um, a, uh, sorry, the accelerator and uh, also uh, Xcache as well. Um, one one little thing I want to touch on with MySQL is that this is obviously a core part of the application architecture of WordPress, uh, but it doesn't have that cool new source <coughs> fun section that uh, you know PHP and Nginx has. So if you have the funds to uh, put MySQL on another server, I definitely recommend it. Uh, with WordPress deployments, you have like this rich dynamic application. Uh, you know, sometimes handling a large database, separating the database server from the application server will, will allow your application to scale more efficiently. So uh, it can handle just basically more high, high traffic loads. Uh, the second one is slow queries. This is kind of a no-brainer, but I don't really see it using a whole lot. So by enabling the slow query log, uh, you'll have the ability to determine, um, you know, if the query took X amount of seconds. So, um, you know, it's kind of a no-brainer, but uh, a lot of people just don't use it. So, uh, the third one is MySQL Tuner. Uh, it's, a, it's a script developed by uh, Major Hayden, uh, Racker Hacker, Rackspace. Uh, unlike the name, it actually doesn't tune anything. What it does is make suggestions on how to improve uh, MySQL performance. So, uh, it, it basically just makes recommendations on what you can change. 
Uh, the last one is just real quick. 32-bit architectures have some RAM limitations on like a per thread level. Uh, so 32-bit binaries cannot address more than like four gigs of RAM or something. So this isn't like a MySQL limitation, it's like a, a technical limitation. So to test the efficiency of all this new software we'll be using, we're gonna run some benchmarks. So the first one we should look at is a shared platform, a shared hosting uh, environment. So uh, this one's, you know, like I said, 95% of what everybody's running right now. And uh, running Apache, uh, Apache CGI, um, and we're also running WordPress 3.0 with the default 2010 theme. Um, the testing method I used was called Siege, similar to Apache Bench or AB. Uh, it's a free and open source uh, benchmarking utility. Uh, the benchmark that we're using here is sending five concurrent connections to the web server for 30 seconds. So uh, the result is about 90 transactions a second, or about 783. Uh, page views, uh, excuse me, 780,000 page views in a day. So how many people are actually getting that much traffic daily? 780,000 page views a day, going here. So that's uh, that's one of us. So uh, now let's look at uh, the new server we just built. This one's running Nginx, we talked about PHP FBM plus APC. This is using a media temple VE server, of course, and we're running a bunch of 10 lucid links. Uh, the testing data is actually all the same, so we're still WordPress 3.0. Um, we're using the 2010 theme. And we're not using any application caching like uh, Super Cache or W3 Total Cache. Uh, the results of this test were obviously more impressive. We got about 19 transactions a second. Uh, on top of that, again, we're not using any of that. So uh, this comes out to about 1.6 1, 1. million page views a day. So we're talking about like $30 a month in terms of service fees. So what happens when you hook up W3 Total Cache? Uh, basically, I enable the plugin and stuck with all the defaults. I think it's like disk mode is, is what the default is for that. Uh, and kept everything uh, the same. So what's happening is the initial request goes through the whole application. So it's PHP and MySQL. And all subsequent requests for that are, are served in like a flat HTML file. So um, that's a big increase compared to nine transactions a second. So you can see that now it's 72 transactions a second. Uh, that's 6.2 million pages. That's, uh, that's pretty good but we're going to do better. So Varnish is a high performance HTTP accelerator designed for content heavy dynamic websites. Um, in contrast to some other um, HTTP accelerators like Squid, this one was done, designed from the ground up as an accelerator. Like the first bullet point states, uh, Varnish is very, very fast. Uh, there, are a bit, there are a few reasons for this. So, uh, Varnish will keep the most recently requested pages and, and share memory and serve them from there. Uh, this produces really high output of WordPress, both in terms of capacity and response time. Uh, we'll look at a diagram of how this works in the next slide. Uh, the configuration language, or, or BCL, is extremely flexible. Uh, the BCL basically tells each request how to handle each part of these incoming requests. So uh, from the get to the put to everything that's making in a request, BCL will tell you how to handle it. So uh, that being said, it, it does present some unique challenges in terms of uh, WordPress cookies and also uh, caching too aggressively. So um, one author from a post of Varnish uh, referred to WordPress as a hormonally imbalanced cookie monster. <laughs> so there are ways to get around that, obviously, we're going to talk about that. So uh, one point I want to make about Varnish is that although it increases performance tremendously, it's kind of a resource hog, although you can trim it down a little bit by reducing the, the amount of threads that Varnish is running. Uh, the longer it runs, the more it's going to store memory and actually consume memory. So uh, I needed at least about one gig of RAM just to serve WordPress uh, to leave plenty of reading room. So uh, another cool feature of Varnish is ESI, which is Edge Side Includes. Um, this wasn't developed by Varnish or any means. It's actually a very popular way of uh, using CDNs. But uh, it allows you to split up your web page into sections and cache them individually. So for, for WordPress example, you don't want to cache your comments section because someone comments and they want to see their comment immediately afterwards. Uh, so there are sections where you do want to cache aggressively, like the header. The header really for me doesn't ever change. Uh, so if you want to cache that section more aggressively, you can. Uh, so that's a really cool thing about Varnish is that you can split it up that way. So say you've installed Varnish and, and set it up on top of Nginx. Um, by default, the cache hit weight is going to be fairly low. It's basically just going to act as a proxy. Um, this is where the BCL comes in. There are a lot of drop-in plugins. Well, actually, a few drop-in plugins that actually provide like a, a BCL specific for WordPress. Uh, one of them is called um, PHP Varnish. 
And like I said, it provides that VCL from the get-go. It's actually really, really efficient. So it hit rates close to about 100%. So that is available on GitHub. So uh, this is essentially what the server setup would look like. We're using two servers, one for web and one for database. Uh, Varnish is running in front of Nginx. So as you can see, it's fielding most of the requests. If it's caching efficiently, it's going to just return the results straight from Varnish. So it never hits the rest of your server, never touches Nginx or PHP. So it's bypassing all of that stuff. If Varnish doesn't find it in the cache, it goes straight to Nginx and serves everything just the same as it would normally. So there are obviously more complex server architectures out there. Uh, this actually doesn't even scratch the service. But if, if utilized properly, this could probably serve 99.99% of all WordPress blogs. Extremely efficient. So let's go back to the benchmark we have. So this is the same DPS this time with Varnish. We're also working with Prime and Cache. This means that the benchmark already stored the result in Cache. Uh, with Varnish doing all the heavy lifting, the server is handling about five transactions a second. 500, excuse me. Uh, in terms of that in a day, it's about 41 million. So that's a considerable leap for about eight transactions a second. So we built this lightweight, fast application server, so now we have to make sure it saves up. Uh, a big part of every server that we put together, or at least I put together, is modern. Uh, so if you keep everything running, we'll check. Yeah, I typically use a combination of what's called Monit and Munit, or Munit, uh, two of my favorite tools. So uh, Monit essentially makes sure uh, everything uh, stays running. It has the ability to stop, restart, um, and execute commands on a system service. It, it can also check like this space and provide like network timely alerts if uh, there's problems outside of where your server lives. Uh, Munit is also a monitoring tool, however, it provides the graphs as you see. Uh, this one was actually developed specifically for PHP FPM, and uh, I've open sourced that and put it on GitHub, so if you're interested, check it out. Uh, with Monit, you can actually set parameters for each system service, uh, like Nginx or MySQL, so if it hits like a certain CPU usage, you can get an alert. And that's that's one of the big pluses, is that you know if you want an SMS, or if you want an email, if you want a Jabber alert, if you're on Jabber, it'll send you a uh, alert. So that's very cool to know that how your server's doing that moment. So it can be pulled like every 60 seconds, I think. So um, one downside of this is that if you're constantly noticing that Monit's restarting your system service because it's using like 80% of your CPU, uh, it's more or less a band-aid. It's not fixing anything. So you, you definitely got to address the situation and add more resources and, and upgrade if necessary. So, I realize we covered kind of a lot of ground really quickly, and I just want to give some tips of those ideas. Um, in terms of like server architecture and design, use what's best for you, or what works, works best for you. Um, you know, if you're on Share Host now, it's working at TJ Sign, if you're on Twitter. So especially if, if you're having trouble, uh, like I said earlier, uh, I'm passionate about helping people. So if you're building something like this, definitely let me know, and uh, I'll try to help out as best I can. So that's really it for me. I tried to uh, save some time on it. So does anybody have any questions, concerns? Uh, yeah. Well, you mean to optimize, what happens when you optimize your database? So if you've ever looked at, that's a good question. Everybody hear that? What it means to optimize the database in PHP management, is that correct? Yeah. Um, if you've ever been in PHP management and you look at, you know, I think normally uh, WordPress database down about 11 tables. Um, You'll see on the right hand column that there's some overhead, uh, which may be a couple bytes on each table. It, usually it's like WP options is a good one, and WP comments are always good. Uh, these, are one, these are tables that you frequently get into. to. Uh, so uh, the problem is that sometimes if the query doesn't execute successfully, or it's just a bad query in general, uh, data will be left hanging outside of uh, the table itself in that overhead column. Uh, optimize the database, which gets rid of that stuff. So make sure everything is running. Um, I really like that you did a performance benchmark of a shared host compared to everything else. Sure. Um, could you say, I know your media temple went off, but the general EPS is whether it's a media temple is a good host. How do you know that whatever a shared host you're on is actually worse than, say, the lowest EPS solution? This is the question I could ask about. I don't really know how to test the shared host. Yeah, that's good. I mean, like I said, I use Sage and like AB, and those are like command line tools basically to test the efficiency of like server requests. But uh, Josh had some good uh, tools like Wiseslaw and things like that. So do like a, you know, if you have access to both of those services and you're trying to like compare, um, you know, set up the same theme. Set up WordPress 3.0. Do like a 20 theme, you know, just blank install. 
Yeah, I'm just not worried about trying to benchmark something out of the browser like that. There's so many other variables. No, you're absolutely right. And that's why I brought that up. Like, command line to a shared host, can you run Siege and, and test it directly? Actually, I, I, was, I have a grid service, and that's what I'm running it on. So it's just, this is an immediate temple. So yeah, I have access to the command line. So you're, you're still running into a couple issues here. Like, we're running like uh, a cluster based service. So uh, performance can vary from like request to request. So, Although it shouldn't, it should be very minimal, but again, there's so many different variables that um, that's why I kind of urge you to, you know, if you can on your own. But so get in on the command line and a couple different share hosts and turn. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, you know, a good service like media templates, huh? you, you have one big blade or something uh, which which gives all these resources, slices them out. Right. Now, what happens when one of the slices, which is Probably not your spice uh, slide goes into a big spike, would it shut off other slices? That's a, that's a really good question, too. Um, the answer is no. Well, we have like some sort of a segment table. So if like a storage segment were to have a higher load than the others, and your site is on it compared to another one, there's not going to really be any like performance decrease. Uh, so it's segmented fairly well compared to like a regular shared service where you're sharing like the box with like 100 different users. Is that the same for the SQL containers? Uh, yeah, actually, it's basically a SQL container. It's just like a VPS. It's just got my SQL running. So you know, it's not in the. That's the some crosstalk to us specifically around MT using uh, some of the clients using just your, your default SQL container, not purchasing an extra service. Sure. We're just getting some crosstalk because of all the traffic moving through that SQL box. Sure. I mean, it's all network. Like that's the way the grid systems work. Or you can use like network file systems and things like that. So. Again, it's going to be a little bit different. Like I said, uh, there's so many different variables. So, did you have one as well? Oh, yeah. I, I really like the numbers that I saw on your benchmarks. Pretty awesome job. Uh, the, the question I have, your benchmarks are so awesome that would you ever need to use something like HyperDB where you're balancing a load database? Yeah. I mean, we're talking about, like, I'm just saying, if you guys have, like, a really, a really important blog and you want to set it up on a VPS because you demand that, um, that will fast uh, and, and great responsiveness. If you're running like clusters of servers, I definitely recommend like HyperDB. That's basically sharding WordPress over multiple uh, databases and, and even data centers, which is really cool. We can use some of the geolocation features. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely an option. If I have more time, I could I, I would get into it. But um, Barry Abrahamson, who's the systems rank with Automatic, um, they came up with that feature. And uh, you know, if you're if you're running with clusters, especially with like WordPress and 